Thank you. 
impact this month. Please stand with me as we read from the script this morning, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell, what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. <clears throat> the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he had been tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is discomforted here, and you are in agony. Besides, all this between you and us is a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. It's the word of God for the people of God. The summer before I started high school, my family took a two-week-long trip out west. We went to the Painted Desert and the Petrified Forest and Mesa Verde, and one of the big highlights, of course, was the grandest chasm of them all, the Grand Canyon. We spent several days there, did some hiking, and just enjoyed our time as a family together at the Great Canyon. And my mom made a deal with me at that, on that trip, that when I turned 25, we would through hike the Grand Canyon together. Now, my 25th birthday came and went, and both of us quickly realized that we were not in any capacity in shape to through hike the Grand Canyon. So it got postponed a few years. But she promised me that when I turned 25, we would hike the Grand Canyon. See, an important detail that you all might have picked up on was that I was about 14 years old, my mother was about 50 years old, and there was quite the chasm between us. And my mom made that promise to me, I learned on my 25th birthday. She made that promise to me 10 years earlier because she had faith that by the time I turned 25, the chasm between us might just be a little bit smaller. But for us in that moment, <laughs> with all of my 14-year-old hormones and all of her 50-year-old hormones, the chasm felt like it would never be crossed. That it would never close. This morning, we hear the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and another great chasm that would not be closed. 
while there is plenty within this text to work with. I think it's helpful to have a little bit of context from one of the verses leading up to the story. Verse 16 says, The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. And since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed. And everyone tries to enter it by force. Discipleship Ministries has done a whole series that I've been following the last few weeks, and they say, entering the kingdom by force presents some problems for us. But what if the force isn't how we typically understand it? It isn't strong arming one's way into the new age by group strength or superior weaponry. What if, instead, Jesus was talking about those who think they deserve entrance. They thought they could get through, get in through their status or wealth. They thought they were owed a place in God's kingdom. Does there seem to be surprise on the part of the rich man who found himself in a place of punishment instead of the paradise he expected? He is, however, bold enough to shout across the gap and ask for mercy. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water to cool his tongue. We don't have any indication of the tone of this request. He asks for mercy, true, but he still seems to see Lazarus as a means to an end. Let him serve me. Send him to me. There's been some considerable debate about the demeanor of the rich man and of Lazarus from biblical scholars. Some point out that Lazarus was allowed to lay at the gate of the rich man, receiving crumbs. The idea that crumbs would fall from the rich man's table all the way out to the front gate seems unlikely. So whatever crumbs Lazarus was living on came to him through the largest of the rich men in the house. Lazarus wasn't chased away and perhaps was fed, not healed, but fed. The question of whether the rich man was a good man or had a good heart is not really addressed in the story. The problem is the gulf. The gulf in life was between the rich and the poor. Jesus, as Luke records the story, doesn't seem concerned with the condition of the heart as much as this disposition of wealth. And in an interesting departure from the usual in this story, the only named character is Lazarus, the poor man. The rich man remains anonymous. He could be anyone. He could be the one Jesus was accusing of loving money. He could be those who have he could be those who have when they are surrounded by those who have not. He could be identifying the gap that exists in this world and suggesting that the gulf continues to be a problem. That's why Abraham cannot send Lazarus to help the poor rich man now suffering. There is a gulf. And the gulf doesn't seem fixable in that life. This means that it can only be closed in the here and now. Jesus is calling his listeners to pay attention to the gulfs that exist in our own world. How do we go about closing these gulfs between the haves and the have-nots? How do we close the gulfs between those who hold power and those who live on the margins? 
How do we close the gulfs? Or how do we cross them? It's also interesting that this conversation in the story is not between God and the rich man, but between Father Abraham and the rich man. <coughs> is that significant? Is, is Jesus saying that we can't wait for a miracle to cross the gulf, but that it is within the power he has given to us to make that change? We, too oft, we think too often of the power of the Holy Spirit we have been given as an internal thing, an individual thing. Our salvation is about making sure that we are right with God. But what if we cannot be right with God unless we are also right with people? What if our internal transformation happens in concert with an external transformation? We as United Methodists do like saying that we are making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. These are one and the same. These internal and external are markers on the same journey. So what are we doing? We as individuals, but also we as the church. To cross these gulfs that we see existing in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods. I would say that here, there are several things that we are doing. And I think that it's important, one, to hear the challenge presented in this text, but also to celebrate the things that we as a congregation are doing to see the gulf, to see the gap and close it. Every Wednesday we have a group of dedicated volunteers who come in to pack bags for fuel so that the children in the schools in our neighborhood have food on the weekends. We have seen a gap. First and third Wednesdays, we have a group of dedicated volunteers who come in to make sure that our neighbors experiencing food shortage have food to eat. Not just for them, but for every member of their household. It seems like in the last six weeks, we have gotten more calls from our neighbors in need of help before they lose access to their, their electricity or their water. We have seen a gap. And we have stepped in to attempt to fill that gap. And sometimes it doesn't feel like we are doing enough. Sometimes someone calls and we have to say, I'm sorry, our fund is depleted and we cannot help right now. And those calls hurt. <coughs> And yet we know that we continue to do all that we can to fully see our neighbors, to fully see their humanity, to fully see their goodness, to fully see their belovedness. And that is when transformation happens. Transformation happens when we are willing to see the chasm between us and work to close it, rather than just pretending it doesn't exist. The chasm also doesn't close overnight, unfortunately. It takes time and intentionality. Just as my mother knew, 
that the Grand Canyon-sized chasm between us was not going to be solved overnight. She knew that one day I would no longer be 14 years old. She would no longer be 50 years old. And we would find a way to be in a new type of relationship with one another. And for that, I am thankful. For that, I am thankful because now, as soon as I leave the church this morning, she's going to get a phone call. Where I say, this is how church went today. This is where I felt the Holy Spirit moving. This is where I saw transformation happen. This is where I was inspired by the people of this church and all that they are committed to and willing to do for one another and for our community. Because bragging about you all is honestly one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> bragging about fuel and the closet and helping hands and the work that was done for 16 years that you all supported Ruben the end. The ways that we see that our presence here matters. That is why we do this. That is where we find our hope. That is where we know that in the here and now, we are working towards transformation. We are working towards closing the chasm that exists between us. And friends, God is with us in this process. And for that, I will always give thanks. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. God, we give you thanks for these, our gifts, gifts that have been graciously given to us that we now humbly return to you to further your kingdom on earth, to continue to close the gulf that, that exists between us and them, so that there is only us in the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
full of news on our prayer list. We pray for healing and comfort and hope. And then we pray for this church. We pray for this church and for Pastor Bernie as they begin their three months together. May this time be filled with rest and renewal and connection. We're going to pray for the ministry they will do together. For the continuing of recognizing and closing the gap that exists between us. <clears throat> we pray for each and every one of the gifts you have poured upon this community. That they might continue to be used to their fullest potential so that we might be part of the transformation of this world. So that we might spread your love and grace and hope and peace and justice. Form the Holy Spirit upon this place. Reminding each of us that we have been called, we have been chosen, we have been created in your own image. We have been called beloved. And now, O oh God, as your beloved children, we pray together the prayer that Jesus first taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to the close of our service this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together hymn number 672, God be with you till we meet again.
Thank you. 